is God racist? Does he favor some people groups and show prejudice or malice towards other people groups? I mean, that's a harsh accusation. Why would someone even raise that kind of charge about God? Well, for one thing, there is the church's history of support for institutional race-based slavery, including the use of the Bible to support that institution. And secondly, we find in the Bible God's apparent preference for the nation of Israel and his apparent harsh treatment of some of their enemies like the Canaanites. So how do we respond to this question, to this charge, is God racist? Well, we begin at the beginning with creation itself where we're told that God created one race of beings, human beings, made in his image such that every human being that descended from those first human beings, every group and people and nation of them, all alike and equally bear the image of God, every human. We come to Genesis 12 and God chooses a couple, Abraham and Sarah, through whom he will raise up one nation, to Israel, to carry out his purposes in the world. But it's clear from the beginning that God's purpose is to bless Israel in order to bless the entire world. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that promise, that purpose is affirmed again and again throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New. In the Old Testament, God commands his people Israel to show kindness and compassion to foreigners and sojourners and aliens. He reminds his people to to provide welcome to those who come into one of their cities seeking refuge. He forgives Israel's arch enemy, Assyria, when they repent after the preaching of Jonah. The prophets remind the people again and again of God's loving purposes for the whole world. Isaiah says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, the nations, so that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. We get to the New Testament and we find the genealogies of Jesus include men and women from other people groups and nations. We find Jesus repeatedly reaching out to Samaritans and to Gentiles. And when Peter and the early church have a hard time opening their arms up to all people, God gives them a vision from heaven. And Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts people from every nation who fear him and do what is right. By the time we get to the book of Revelation, the end of the story, we read that people from every tribe and language and people and nation worshiping God together and ruling over a new heaven and new earth. From beginning to end, the Bible declares God's love, welcome, and purpose for all people everywhere. Yeah, but what about slavery? How do we explain the Bible's apparent tolerance for slavery? and the church's historical use of the Bible to support slavery. Well, it is true that the Bible acknowledges the reality of slavery and speaks into that reality, but that's not the same as endorsing or condoning that reality. The Bible never endorses polygamy, but it happened, and so the Bible speaks about it. Several of the Historical, cultural things can help us understand what's happening here. Understand, first of all, that the slavery we read about in the ancient world was not the institutional race-based slavery that we're familiar with in the modern world and even in our own nation's history, which is, in fact, an abomination to God. Slavery in the ancient world was certainly a repressive economic structure but it also provided a living and work and housing for for millions and millions of people. And it often came with opportunities to, to own property, to earn wages, to advance, to be promoted, and ultimately to gain and purchase one's freedom. Second thing we need to understand is that when the Bible does speak into this reality of slavery, it does so in ways that promote their dignity 
and, and, and fairness. Slaves were to enjoy the Sabbath day just like the Israelites were. There were legal protections around them when they got into trouble. The practice of kidnapping people and turning them into slaves, that was clearly forbidden. Runaway slaves were to be treated with mercy, unlike the Code of Hammurabi, which called for them to be executed. It was expected in the ancient world and in Israel that these slaves would eventually either purchase their freedom or be granted their freedom in the seventh year or the year of Jubilee. When we come to the New Testament, Paul speaks redemptively into this reality of slavery, breathing respect and dignity and kindness into the equation. In his first letter to Timothy, he condemns slave trading. People will sometimes say the Bible never condemns slavery. Yes, it does. First Timothy chapter 1, Paul condemns slave trading as, as contrary to the gospel of God and to sound doctrine. And in Galatians, he lays down one of those timeless truths, an explosive truth that would eventually inspire the abolition of slavery in the Western world. In the book of Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when it comes to this charge of racism, both of these principles we're learning help us understand what's happening here the historical cultural setting, the timeless truths of scripture, but there's a third one that helps. And I'm gonna call it, consider the redemptive movement of scripture, the redemptive movement. We've talked about, the, talked about this before, how, how God gradually reveals more and more of himself and his ways as we move through the Bible and as we move through human history. God meets humanity where we are. In the ancient world, he meets humanity at a very primitive place, a barbaric moment. And he begins moving them in better and better directions. And he continues to move them all through scripture and through human history. Over time, he reveals more and more of his justice and his compassion and his righteousness in ever-increasing measure. Slaves and foreigners are better off in Deuteronomy than they are in Exodus. They're better off in the New Testament than they were in the Old Testament. And they're better off in the contemporary world than they were some hundred years ago before we understood and applied fully the truths that we find in Scripture. Racism is evil in all of its forms. But don't pin it on God. It's human beings who bear responsibility for racism and for slavery. We need to repent of it continually. The church needs to repent of it. We need to renounce it. We need to, to resist it. We need to overcome it in keeping with the ultimate purposes of God and his love for all people. 